I would like to welcome you all to the 35th anniversary of the Master of Engineering Management Program, also our Industry Appreciation Dinner. Uh, we're all here to see Guy Kawasaki, but before that, I want to actually introduce to you all, and who will actually introduce Guy, uh, is our Dean, Dean Julio Otino of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Dean Otino. Thank you. So I'll be brief uh, for two reasons. One, no one ever asked me to, your talk was too short. And also, Guy has a boundary condition, a plane play to catch 9.15. Yeah, so, um, but I'm delighted to see this good looking crowd here tonight. And I want to extend my congratulations to the program. They sent 35th anniversary of MEM. The program was founded by Al Rubenstein, who was one of the first, the top of the line appointment in McCormick is Walter P. Murphy professor. And Al Rubenstein was one of those. And he wanted to target local experienced engineers with a focus on innovation and R&D processes. And I think the MEM now, especially during these times, has surpassed all expectations. In the past 35 years, MEM has grown to be one of the largest uh, professional master's programs in McCormick. We have eight of them. And it has one of the largest alumni bases. And it's great to see a fraction of the more than 800 alumni here tonight. MEM has also led the way in an effective initiative to build a nationwide network. In 2006, Northwestern joined a consortium of MEM schools called MEM PC. That includes the absolute best MEM uh, schools in the country, including MIT, Stanford, Duke, Dartmouth, USC, and Cornell. So part of what constitutes success is keeping the right company, and MEM here in Northwestern have been a leader in this regard. So MEM feels a critical void in our world, and it's hard to open a paper from the Wall Street to the Financial Times that doesn't make reference to this kind of a space now. So, now is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Guy Kawasaki. I'm going to keep this short. Uh, let him do, dazzle you with his talk. So, Guy Kawasaki is a special advisor to the Motorola Business Unit of Google. He's also the author of Ape, What the Plus, Enchantment, and nine other books. Uh, previously, he was the chief evangelist at Apple. He has a BA from Stanford, an MBA from UCLA, and at least one honorary degree from Babson College. So please join me in welcoming Guy Kawasaki. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Iqbal, uh, who we worked together at, at Motorola, <laughs> we had a little side chuckle there when uh, the introduction was read because, you know, the advisor of Motorola, uh, part of Google, that kind of changed about a week ago. So, shows you um, how fast your bio can change in these days. Um, it's a very interesting time. Uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about how to be enchanting, or be even more enchanting. Uh, this is based on my experience working at Apple, as well as as a venture capitalist and entrepreneur. And I hope to communicate some skills to you, uh, some techniques that will make you uh, even more productive, influential uh, person who can change the world. So that's my goal tonight. Um, Little known story, uh, I actually got into Northwestern. I almost attended Northwestern 
but I had to choose for my MBA between UCLA and Northwestern. And at the time, it was like negative seven degrees here. And so it was kind of an IQ test, you know, UCLA, Northwestern, UCLA. So I went to UCLA. Um, what can I say? Uh, but I, I, I have great respect for your school. Um, I know you have a great journalism school. I love journalism. So I'm very happy to be here. And maybe I can get an honorary doctorate. Where'd the dean go? <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you tonight about enchantment. And uh, I use a top 10 format for my speeches. Uh, this is because I've been in high tech for about 30 years, and I've seen many, many high tech speakers. And there are two salient points about high tech speakers. First, they suck. <laughs> and second, they go long. That's a deadly combination. You know, if you suck and your speech was short, it's OK. Uh, <laughs> and if you're great and your speech goes long, it's OK. But if you suck and go long, you know, it's like being stupid and arrogant. It's like, you know, full of bugs and hard to use. I mean, it's just. Not a good combination. So what I do is I use a top 10 format so that if you think I suck, at least you know about how much longer I'm going to suck because <laughs> I'm exactly 10 points for you. Uh, and tonight, it's an unusual situation. Um, I have to explain this in advance. So when I landed today at O'Hare, uh, I got a text message from my wife that two pipes have broken in our house. So our house is kind of flooded. And so I was going to go back tomorrow morning, but now I have to go back tonight because I have this issue here. So usually I would hang around and take pictures and do whatever you want. Um, I cannot do that tonight, all right? So as soon as I finish, I'm going to jet out of here. I don't want you tweeting that, oh, guy's such an asshole. You know, he, didn't even have, <laughs> he didn't even have time to shake hands and take pictures. He just jetted out of here. You know, typical kind of Silicon Valley, shallow, you know, whatever. I'm really an enchanting person. Um, <laughs> so, but tonight, tonight I'm facing somewhat of a crisis. And, you know, of all places in the world, you should appreciate busted pipes in a house in the winter, right? So um, that's what's going to happen. Uh, so my speech on enchantment. So uh, the first thing that I learned about enchantment is that the pillar, or first pillar, is that you have to be likable. Because think about it. Have you ever been enchanted by someone you didn't like? Probably not. Uh, this is a great example of likability. This is me with Richard Branson. The scenario here is that we're together in Moscow. Uh, speaking at the same conference, and he comes up to me in the speaker ready room, and he asks me if I fly on Virgin. And I, being the honest person I am, I say, you know, Richard, I'm global service with United. I don't know how I got to be global service. I don't want to jeopardize global service. So I don't fly on Virgin. And when I said that, he got on his knees, and he started polishing my, sh my shoes with his jacket. So this is the moment I started flying Virgin America. <laughs> um, and I captured this picture by luck, and I think this truly captures likability. Uh, he's a very likable person. I obviously work for Steve Jobs, and I can tell you that Steve Jobs never got on his knees <laughs> for anybody to use a Macintosh, iPhone, iPod, or iPad. Trust me when I tell you. <coughs> Carriers got on their knees, but he never got on his knees. Um, this is likability. The start of likability is a great smile. This is called a Pan Am smile. This is not a great smile. This is the fake smile. This is the flight attendant is not really happy to see those passengers. She's just kind of grinning and bearing it, clenching a pencil between her teeth. A great smile is called a Duchenne smile. This is a Duchenne smile. The difference between a Duchenne smile and a Pan Am smile are the eyes. The key to a great smile are the eyes. You actually want crow's feet. Okay, that's a good thing. No more Botox, no more plastic surgery. You want crow's feet. This is a woman named Mari Smith. She's a Facebook marketing expert. And uh, when I saw, well, my first choice for this picture was George Clooney. But it's very expensive to use George Clooney's image legally. <laughs> and so I, I saw this picture of her. I sent her an email. I said, I have good news for you and bad news. Good news is, if you let me use your picture, I'll go all over the world telling thousands of people about you, Mari. The bad news is I'm going to do that because you have crow's feet. Um, <laughs> lucky, she's a great person. Let me do it. This is a Duchenne smile, crow's feet. Next thing you need to do is to learn to accept others, to learn to accept others no matter how much jewelry they have on their face, no matter what gender, sexual orientation, creed, color, religion, socioeconomic background. I mean, have, think about this. Have you ever been enchanted by someone who you perceived didn't accept you for what you are, that wanted you to change? Probably not. So the second step is you have to learn to accept others for what they are. 
The third step is to default to yes. That is to always be thinking, yes, what can I do for you? Yes, how can I help you? That by, by, uh, by default, you're always willing to help, as opposed to wondering, what is this person trying to get from me? How can I say no? My experience through my career is that if you always say yes, you have a more enchanting relationship. It leads to much greater success. The downside of being taken advantage of is far less than the upside. Did I say that right? The upside is far greater. Yeah, the upside of defaulting to yes is far greater than the downside of being taken advantage of. I think in my career, maybe five people tried to take advantage of me. Those five people were not worth enchanting with hindsight. But defaulting to yes has led me into relationships and situations that paid off by the bushel. Um, trust me and try this. Just default to yes. Next, next pillar of enchantment is to achieve trustworthiness because you can be liked but not trusted. For example, you could like a Hollywood celebrity but not trust the Hollywood celebrity. Right? You could like Paris Hilton. You could like Kim Kardashian. You could, at an extreme, like Charlie Sheen. That doesn't mean you trust Charlie Sheen or Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian. So it's trustworthiness. The key to trustworthiness is to understand the sequence of events. It's not a chicken or egg. There's a definite sequence. You have to trust others before you can expect them to trust you. The onus, the burden is upon you. Some examples. Amazon. You have 30 days to read a Kindle ebook, and you can still return it. Many people could read the entire book in those 30 days. Amazon trusts you not to defeat its policy. And so I think many people buy Kindle ebooks they might not have bought before because they know they can return it. It's such a generous and flexible return policy. Amazon said that it trusts customers, so customers have come to trust Amazon. Zappos. Millions of women buy shoes with Zappos. If Tony Shea had said to me when he started Zappos, or he, didn't, he wasn't there at day one, but he was an investor in the early times. If he had said to me, Guy, our business model is we will enable women to buy shoes without trying them on or seeing them, I would have told him he's nuts, that women will not buy shoes online without seeing the shoe, without trying on the shoe. And yet, millions of women do, including my wife. There is a box from Zappos into our house every week. Okay? How did women come to trust Zappos? It's because Zappos trusted women first. They have this incredible policy where they will pay shipping both ways. Buy the shoe, if you don't like it, we'll pay for you to return it to us. Other companies, you have to call up and you have to get an RMA, you have to arrange for this whole thing. So simple with Zappos. A box comes into your house, a box goes out of your house. No expense to you. And the cl third classic example is Nordstrom. The great story about Nordstrom, which I checked, it's true. Nordstrom once took the return of a used tire. It does not sell tires, but it wanted to show to its customers that they trusted the customer. They took a tire that it clearly did not sell. That is trust. In all cases, in all cases, it shows that the organization trusted its customers before the customers trusted the organization. The onus is upon you. Next thing about trust is to become a baker, not an eater. The difference between a baker and an eater is that an eater sees the world as a zero-sum game. Set size pie. The more people eat of the pie, the less for me. A baker doesn't see the world as a zero-sum game. A baker says, I can bake more pies. I can bake bigger pies. I can bake cookies and cakes. Everybody can get more dessert. Bakers are more trustworthy than eaters. Because eaters are always worried about, will they have enough left over for me? Bakers just believe they can make more pies. Last thing is to find something to agree on. In your initial attempts to enchant people, establish some kind of beachhead, no matter how small. Two examples. With Apple, we tried to make Macintosh a spreadsheet database and word processing machine in the mid-'80s. We were zero for three there. Finally, we found something that we agreed with the marketplace, that Macintosh was good for desktop publishing. It was because of a killer app called PageMaker. No PageMaker, no Apple today. No Apple today, it would be a different world. We'd all have phones where the 
There was a real keyboard. We'd have phones where the battery lasted for more than 10 hours. We'd have phones where the GPS actually worked. It would be a different world. Okay? <laughs> and I, I believe PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple that saved Apple. And I believe in God. And one of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of God. Okay? <laughs> there are no atheist Apple customers. You may be wondering, what the hell does this have to do with anything? Well, there's an apocryphal story out of Latin America. Two Latin American countries having this diplomatic crisis. They meet in a neutral third country. They make no progress for days. Chief diplomat of one country says to chief diplomat of the other, we need to reach some kind of conclusion by Friday. I have to return home on Friday. I have to return home on Friday because I promised my wife I would take her to the opera. He goes on to say, I hate the opera. My wife forces me to take her to the opera. The other chief diplomat hears this story and says, oh, your wife forces you to take her to the opera too? They found something to agree on, a dislike of opera. So whether it is a dislike of opera, or desktop publishing, or hockey, or adoption, or street food, whatever it is, find something to agree on to develop trust. The third thing is to perfect your product or service. I have tried to enchant people with great stuff, and I have tried to enchant people with crap. And it is a lot harder with crap. So I'm going to give you the five qualities of great stuff. Great stuff is deep, lots of features, lots of functionality. Right? The, the company has anticipated what you'll need as you come up the power curve. Great stuff is also intelligent. When you look at it, you say, aha, uh -huh, this company understood my pain. This company understood my problem. This is an analog example. This is a GT500 Shelby Mustang, 650 horsepower. For those of you not into cars, this is the equivalent of 6.8 Priuses. Okay? So this is truly a badass Mustang. Truly. I would love to buy one of these cars. I'm 59 years old. I'm going through a midlife crisis. Feelings of impotency and inadequacy. I would love to compensate by buying this car. Okay? But I have two boys who are drivers, 18 and 20. And the thought of unleashing upon society these two boys in this kind of car <laughs> is just immoral. And so I learned, however, that, that Ford makes a very intelligent product called the My Key. And what the My Key enables you to do is program the top speed of the car into the key. So on those rare occasions when dad is going to Chicago overnight and they had to drive my Mustang, I would give them a key that would not allow them to go faster than 55 miles an hour. <laughs> that is a very intelligent product. Great products are also clean. You have to be green today. It is a requirement. Great products are clean today. Great products are empowering. They make you feel more creative and more productive. You know, Macintosh, that's the key to Macintosh. It becomes one with you. It makes you more creative and productive. Windows, you have to fight. You have to wrestle it to the ground, right? Nobody becomes one with Windows. You have to defeat Windows. That's the difference. And finally, great products are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface, about the human interface, the design, the industrial design. So if you want to be enchanting, it's much easier to be enchanting with something that's deep, intelligent, clean, empowering, and elegant. Roll the dicey. Next thing is to launch your product or service. The key to a great launch is to tell a story. You know, in technology, Maybe it's only in Silicon Valley, but everybody stands up and they say we have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, enterprise quality, scalable product. Everybody says that. Nobody says I have a buggy, slow piece of shit. Okay? <laughs> everybody says patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting. All right? So those adjectives mean nothing. Instead, you should tell a story, a story about why you created this, why you created this phone, why did we create Moto G, why did we create Moto X, why did we create a Macintosh? The story that, you know, we thought it was so bad, the only place you could use a computer was to drive to a university or work for a large company or work for the government. So Steve and I created Apple. We wanted to personalize computers. Or my girlfriend wanted to sell Pez dispensers online. She collects Pez dispensers. There's no way for her to do it. So I started eBay. That's the story Pierre Amidyar tells about eBay. Total bullshit story, OK? <laughs> but it's a great story. It's a great story. So I'm telling you, tell a story. 
Why did you start this project, this product, this company? Tell a story. Everybody says they have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, revolutionary, enterprise class, scalable product. Everybody says that. Tell a story instead. Next thing is to plant many seeds. It used to be that you sucked up to the Wall Street Journal, they told everybody to what to use, and they made you. Okay? That's how Lotus 123 was made. The Wall Street Journal said this is the best spreadsheet. It's not true anymore. It's because of social media. And so now you have to plant many seeds because it's easy to identify Walt Mossberg at the Wall Street Journal. It is much harder to find Lonely Boy 15. Lonely Boy 15 at AOL.com still lives with his mother. Lonely Boy 15 has 15 friends. Lonely Boy 15 still sleeps on Buzz Lightyear sheets. But Lonely Boy 15 is an opinion leader in this small group of 15 people. And if you believe in this theory that it's not simply a top-down world anymore, then you have to find Lonely Boy 15. Lonely Boy 15's made Twitter successful. Twitter is eight years old. There are no stories that are eight years old where Walt Mossberg eight years ago said, Twitter is the future of communications. Because eight years ago, when we smart people looked at Twitter, we said, what the hell would you use this for? We already have SMS. We have email. We have chat. Why would you want another service? So you can tell people that your cat rolled over? That's the goal of Twitter? Who could have foresaw what Twitter would be? Lonely Boy 15 is the key. Next thing is to use salient points. This is very good for engineers. On the left side, you see the engineering term. On the right side, you see what would be more useful. If you're in food, you describe your food in terms of caloric content. You go to the Whole Foods, you turn over the bag, you say, huh, this bag of chips has 300 calories. What exactly is 300 calories? We know that's a unit of measure, right? But wouldn't it be much better if you turned over a bag of chips and it said, if you eat this bag, you have to run 20 miles? <laughs> that is a much better way to describe what's in the bag. In a not-for-profit business, people like to talk in terms of the size of their fund. But if you're a donor, you don't care about the size of the fund. You care about how many months of food Will my $500 donation buy this family in Ethiopia? That's what you care about, not the size of the fund. And in the gadget business, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, God, if I only had 16 gigabytes more of SSD storage, my life would be complete. Nobody says that. People wake up in the morning saying, I want something cool and thin and beautiful that can hold 10,000 songs, and 1,000 movies, and 100,000 books. They think in terms of, Books and movies and songs, not gigabytes. So use the stuff on the right-hand side. Use those kind of measures, salient points, not the jargon on the left-hand side when you introduce a product or a service. Next thing is to overcome resistance. This is a picture depicting overcoming resistance. In the late 80s, uh, there was a big problem in the game business, i.e. retailers didn't want to stock electronic games anymore. It was a tarnished business. And Nintendo realized it had a big problem. So what Nintendo did is it added a robot to its game and called it an educational toy. Then it told kids to ask their parents for Christmas for an educational toy to learn robotics. That is a much better pitch than, Mom, Dad, buy me a game to shoot stuff up. That's how it overcame resistance. It changed it into a toy, an educational toy. More ways to overcome resistance. Provide social proof. I think this is the genius of the iPod. That when the iPod first came out, it was different in many ways, but one particularly visible way was the white earbud. People learned that white earbud equals iPod, right? So as you saw more white earbud, you became more comfortable with the fact that you might buy an iPod. And eventually, you bought an iPod because resisting Apple is futile, right? So you bought an iPod, and guess what? When you bought an iPod, you added to the pool of white earbuds. So the more iPods, the more white earbuds. But the more white earbuds, the more iPods. It became social proof. It reinforced itself. Figure out a way to do this. You know, when you get an email via many smartphones, it says sent on AT&T, you know, 4G LT network. That's, that's the signature. That's, we can change that. People can change that if you could figure out how. But what AT&T wants to do is they want to show that a lot of people are using AT&T. They embed that in the footer of the email. Figure out a way that your customers provide social proof. Next thing is to use a data set to change your mindset. 
This is particularly useful when you want to change people's minds with what they think is facts. So here's an example. This chart shows that in 1950, if you lived in China, Asia, India, you know, Africa, you had seven kids, six kids per woman, and you lived a very short 40-year life. That's 1950. To this day, I think many people believe that unless you live in America, you have lots of kids and you die young, right? So what if you wanted to change this mindset? This is the work of an organization called Gapminder, and they animate data. And let me show you what happens over the next 59 years. The whole world is shifting into that upper left-hand corner, right? So it's not just America. Everywhere in the world, you have fewer kids and longer lives, except navy blue, which is Africa. But today, at this point, most of the world is just like the United States. Two and a half kids, 70 years of life. This is a very powerful way to use a data set to change a mindset. Next way to break down resistance is to be sure you enchant all the influencers. Many people believe it's just the father. You'd be wrong about 80% of the time. It's really the mother. Sometimes it's the sister. Sometimes it's the grandfather. In my family, it's the daughter. <laughs> right? So if you want to get to me, you get to my daughter. I want to make my daughter happy. The key to my happiness. I can only be as happy as my daughter is happy. She's the gating item to my happiness. So if you truly want to influence me, you work on my daughter, not just me. Next thing is to make your enchantment endure. Grateful Dead is a very good example of enduring enchantment. They've endured for decades. One of the reasons why is because at a Grateful Dead concert, they set aside an area for people to record the concert. They call them tapers, not that anybody uses tape anymore. And so they encourage people to come to this area, and record the concert, and then share the music. While the rest of the music industry is suing little old ladies for downloading cello music, the Grateful Dead is encouraging people to pirate the concert because they figured out that the most hardcore Grateful Dead fan comes to the concert. That Grateful Dead fan would record the concert and get more listeners for the Grateful Dead. It's completely reverse thinking to the rest of the music industry. One of the reasons why the Grateful Dead endures. More ways to endure. In engineering, you build an ecosystem. It's not just the DVD. It's not just the digital download. It's the totality of developers, VARs, dealers, conferences, webinars, documentation, books, all this kind of stuff. Right? If you're a restaurant, it's not just the food. It's the valet service. It's the union for the restaurant workers. It's the organic farms where you buy the vegetables and the produce and the produce is vegetables, the, the chickens and the pigs and you know whatever else you serve. It's not just the restaurant. It's not just the DVD. It's the totality of it. When you have this totality, you are a much stronger product. Think of all the apps that come from the Android developers that would not exist if Android apps only came from Google. Same thing with iOS. Think of the hundreds of thousands of iOS apps that come because of the ecosystem of iOS, not simply because of Apple. Next thing is to invoke reciprocation. This carpet depicts re reciprocation. It shows a battle in Ethiopia when Italy invaded Ethiopia. When Italy invaded Ethiopia, the people of Mexico collected money and sent money to Ethiopia to help them. 85 years go by, big earthquake in Mexico, and guess what? The people of Ethiopia collected money and sent money back to Mexico. Now, the context you have to understand is at the time, Ethiopia was in the middle of a famine. So it wasn't like it was doing really well. They were dying from starvation, and yet they felt so strongly that they had to reciprocate that they collected money in the middle of a famine and sent money back. Another example is after the Civil War, the people of New York bought the people of Charleston not one but two fire trucks. The first one was on a boat that sank. 150 years go by, 9-11 happens. And what do the people of Charleston do? They buy the people of New York a fire truck to reciprocate for something that happened 150 years later, earlier. That is reciprocation. That's how powerful reciprocation is. I'll give you two power tips about reciprocation. I learned it from Bob Cialdini in this book. Let's say that I do something for you. Okay, I do something for you. I think like a, 
uh, baker not an eater, I default to yes. I do something for you, right? So she thanks me. So what is the power tip here? When she thanks me, what is the optimal response? The optimal response is not you're welcome. The optimal response is, I know you would do the same for me. I know you would do the same for me. I'm telling her she's a good person. I know you would do the same for me. I'm also telling her, I know you will do the same <laughs> for me. <laughs> Second power tip about reciprocation. Let's say that being truly a baker and a person who defaults to yes, I am happy to do more for her, but I am not clairvoyant. However, because she already owes me, and I made sure she knows that she owes me, she hesitates to ask me to do more. So we're kind of stuck, right? So believe it or not, the best thing I can do for our relationship now is to tell her how to pay me back. Because by telling her how to pay me back, and she pays me back, we clear the decks, and she can ask me to do more. So contrary to what you might think about forgiving debts and telling people, forget about it, don't worry about it, the best thing you can do is tell someone who owes you something how to reciprocate so that person is comfortable asking you to do more. Next thing is don't rely on money. The key to enchantment is the quality of your product, the trustworthiness, and the likability. Affiliate fees, commissions, all that, hallelujah. Okay, I, I'm not a hypocrite. I believe in compensation. But the core of your enchantment should be based on likability, trustworthiness, and quality, not on money. You cannot rent enchantment. Okay? It's not money. Next thing is to be a great presenter. If you want to enchant people, you need to be able to present and to speak. Some tips for you. First, customize the introduction. Customize the introduction. Show that you know where you are. You know who you're talking to. That there's some kind of bond. Like, I got into Northwestern. I had established some kind of link to you, right? I like to do it with pictures. So when I was in Moscow speaking um, with Richard Branson, the day before I went to Red Square and I took this picture and I opened up my speech in Moscow, I said, wow, I had no idea. You Russians, you have really big balls. <laughs> and then when I was in Scotland, I opened up with this picture of me at Crombie's checking out haggis, which is not something I recommend that you eat. But, you know, if you're speaking in Scotland and you put up a picture with you looking at haggis, you kind of, you know, you own the, own the audience. And the third example here, is this is from Istanbul. I'm in the Grand Bazaar here. The guy behind me is the shopkeeper. He has glasses on. I assure you, that is a Duchenne smile. That guy is happy. You know why he's happy? You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this fez. <laughs> This stinking fez has been in my, my family's shop for three generations. I finally found someone stupid enough to buy the fez, right? I bring happiness wherever I go. So I opened up my speech in Istanbul with this slide, and they loved it. Customize the introduction. Next thing you do is to sell your dream. Sell your dream. When Steve Jobs introduced an iPhone, he did not say, I have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, combination of $188 worth of parts manufactured in China under somewhat suspect labor conditions. <laughs> okay? That's not how he positions an iPhone. Position an iPhone is cool and thin and beautiful. It'll change your life. It'll make your life better. Right? Sell your dream. Not the parts, not the cost of goods sold, not the chips, not the RAM, not the megahertzes and the gigahertzes and the gigabytes. Sell your dream for the benefits that your products and services provide. The last thing is the Guy Kawasaki rule of PowerPoint. The optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. 10. Your engineers are looking at me like with eyes of daggers of hypocrisy, because you know I'm way past 10, right? right? I'm like, this is number 45 or so. Well, I'll tell you. And let me explain why I'm telling you to use 10, and I'm on number 45. It's because you are not me. Okay. <laughs> Next thing, you should be able to give those 10 slides in 20 minutes. Yes, you have a 60-minute slot, but let's face it, to this day, 95% of the world is using a Windows laptop, right? So, Windows laptop users, how long does it take you to make it work with the projector? 40 minutes. <laughs> so, if everybody in the world used a Macintosh, this would be the 1060 rule, but it's not true. So, I had to lower it down so that I could compensate so all the people who needed 40 minutes to make their Windows laptop work with the projector would not feel excluded. Okay? 10 slides, 20 minutes, and then the optimal size font is 30 points. 
If you use 8, 10, or 12, you're going to put too much text. You put too much text, you're going to read the text. If you read the text one slide into your presentation, the audience is going to figure out, this person is clueless. This person is reading verbatim to me. I can read faster silently to myself better than this clown can read them to me. Why do I need to listen to him? He's just reading the slide, and you will lose your audience. If you want a rule of thumb, good rule of thumb is figure out who the oldest person is in your audience, divide his or her age by two. 60-year-old people, divide by 230. 50-year-old, 25. Okay? Someday you may be pitching to a 16-year-old VC. God bless you. That day, use the eight-point font. <laughs> but until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Number eight, use technology. We are in a great time to enchant people. I mean, think about it. The, the greatest enchanter of all, perhaps, was Dale Carnegie, right? How to win friends and influence people. What could he do to expand his message and to foster the spread of his message? He could get 300 people in a New York ballroom. Best case, right? No Twitter, no Facebook, no Pinterest, no Instagram, no Google+. That's all he could do. Not even email, no website, right? We have all that at our disposal we can be so much more enchanted. Step number one is to remove the speed bumps to your enchantment. This is a screenshot of CAPTCHA. How many of you have encountered CAPTCHA in your life? Yes, what is the purpose of CAPTCHA? It is to reduce the number of customers you have. Okay. <laughs> this is a very effective use of CAPTCHA. The first word is Holber. Second word, anybody know what language the second word is? <laughs> How many people? How many of you? Raise your hand. Three, four, five, six, seven, okay. It's eight. So like eight out of 150. That's Hebrew. The eight people who know that's Hebrew. How many of you have a Hebrew keyboard handy? <laughs> okay, one. So all right, so one out of 150 people could get past this capture. It's not bad, you know. And I, you know, ironies of ironies, I wish I could tell you I was so dedicated and so smart to plan this. This is the first capture screen I encountered with something like this. That's the Hebrew word for obstacle. <laughs> I, what's the odds of that, huh? Somebody pointed out to me one day. So, this is an example. Remove the speed bumps. Remove the speed bumps. If you're like Motorola and you're in the phone business, we have to enable people to migrate stuff from one Android phone to the next Android phone. If people are coming from an iPhone and you have a thousand songs, ten thousand songs in your iPhone, well, you got to get it to your Google Play, right? So there's a way to do that. You need to remove all these speed bumps. Next thing. Oh, this is an example of positive removing speed bumps. A company called Sungevity. They're in the business of installing residential solar panels. One of the big pain in the ass parts of solar panel is that first appointment. You have to be home, they have to meet you up, they've got to look at your roof, do the estimate and all that. Sungevity has removed that speed bump. You just give it your address, they look you up on a satellite photo. This is a satellite photo. They mock up the roof. They can figure out how big the solar panel can be, how much it'll cost, and how much power it'll put out just by your home address, completely removing that first speed bump. Next thing you do is, in particular in social media, it is about providing value. It is not about you promoting. A good model to use is NPR. NPR puts out great stuff. In particular, I love Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me from Chicago, right? So it puts out great stuff. It puts out such great stuff that guess what? We tolerate the telethon. Nobody wants a telethon. Nobody's interested in getting the Eton hand crank you know, radio in case of nuclear attack so we can listen to how we're going to die. Nobody wants that radio, right? We tolerate the telethon. Some of us even give money. Why is that? It's because NPR has earned the right to promote to us because it provides such great content all year long. Think of NPR when you do social media. You have to provide value, information. What? just happened. Insights, what does it mean that this just happened? Or assistance, how to make this good thing happen for you, how to avoid this bad thing. This should be 90% of your social media. You're providing value. Then you can do 10% promotion. You want people to follow you because of the value you provide. Next thing is some rules of thumb about engagement. You have to do this fast. The life of a tweet is about I think it's about an hour. Some people say it's five hours. Google Plus, two, three hours. Email, two, three days. You have to do it fast. You have to do it flat. Remember, LonelyBoy15 at AOL.com. He could be the person that makes you tip. 15 followers, lives with his mother, Buzz Lightyear Sheets, right? He could make you tip. 
It's not just the Walt Mossbergs. People don't go top down anymore. It's bottom up. And the last thing is you have to do this all the time now. Uh, social media you know, used to be this experiment. I don't think it's an experiment anymore. It's core. It's fundamental to marketing at this point. Next topic is to enchant your boss. How do you enchant your boss? The key to enchanting your boss is when your boss asks you to do something, you drop everything else. It is not optimal. It is not necessarily fair. But this is the most effective way. If your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. For those of you who are married, men in particular, I'm giving you a piece of advice. When your wife, who is essentially your boss, tells you to do something, drop everything else. Do not sit there trying to argue and explain to her why what you're doing is more important than what she's asking, because you are wrong. Okay? <laughs> Just drop everything else. It's great marital advice, too. So let's suppose that your boss says, ah, I need some help. I need a PowerPoint presentation. You drop everything else, and you prototype really fast. Right? If your wife asks you to do something, just say, OK, honey, is this along the lines of what you want me to do? If your boss asks you to make a prototype, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, just put up the text, put in, drop in a few pictures. This is what I gave to the graphic designer who created this presentation. I gave her this as a quick prototype. This is the text. This is the kind of photos. Now make it beautiful. The point of prototyping is twofold. One, you prove that you dropped everything else. You're not just saying you dropped everything else. Here's the draft of the PowerPoint. Am I on the right track? That's benefit number one. Benefit number two is the quicker you get something, the more feedback, the better you can make it. Third way to enchant your boss is to deliver bad news early. Contrary to what you may have learned or believe, the concept of I wait to the last minute to tell my boss bad news because prior to the last minute, the miracle can occur and the bad news go away is flawed. It never goes down like that. If you want to enchant your boss, you should tell your boss about bad news or the possibility of bad news as quickly as possible so that you can prevent the bad news from happening. Next thing is how to enchant people who work for you. The key to this I learned in a book called Drive by Daniel Pink. In this book, he says pay people adequately. But if you want to take them to the next level, you want them to be enchanted with working for you. If you want them to be evangelists for your company, then you provide a MAP. MAP stands for mastery, meaning come work for me, you will master new skills. You'll be working autonomously, independently. We don't breathe down your neck. Finally, you'll be working towards a higher purpose, not simply making money. Provide employees with a MAP, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Next thing is to empower people, to tell people, I trust you, you have good judgment, do what you think is right for the customer. I empower you to make a decision. And the final way to enchant people who work for you is to suck it up. This is a great show called Dirty Jobs. How many of you watch Dirty Jobs? Great show. What makes Dirty Jobs so enchanting? Mike Rowe will do the dirty job. He will work in the paint factory, the poi factory, clean the outside of a skyscraper, get the dead skunks from underneath the house, get the dead rats, perform artificial insemination on chickens, pigs, turkeys, llamas. He will do whatever it takes. You need to be a boss like Mike Rowe, never asking your employees to do something that you yourself would not do. Right? Do the dirty job. Suck it up. Do the dirty job. And this is my last slide. This is the cover of this book. Um, I just want to reiterate that I think the most important components of enchantment, by far, if you get these three right, you got the three pillars, is likability, trustworthiness, and quality. So remember the five characteristics of quality, deep, intelligent, clean, empowering, and elegant. Are you making something dicey? Next thing, remember trustworthiness. Think of Zappos. Women buy shoes without seeing the shoe or trying them on. That is trust. And how did that occur? It's because Zappos trusted women with this policy where they will pay shipping both ways. And then finally, remember likability. Yes, the Duchenne smile. But keep in mind that picture of Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson, billionaire, getting down on his knees so that I would fly on Virgin. That is likability. So you want the likability of Richard Branson, you want the trustworthiness of Zappos, and you want something that's deep, intelligent, complete, excuse me, clean, empowering, 
and elegant, something dicey. And that's the key and the art of enchantment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.